It's very important to me to have a home. And home for me is this area, this ambiance of mine that my wife and I have created for ourselves in Los Angeles. Because all through my 13 years in New York, although I had a house there, my home was still here. And I spent a lot of time in Israel. Now I will be going to Munich, but I still will be coming back here to my surroundings. It's a house we bought in 1974 from Steve McQueen. And his wife told me then, he says, I think you will stay here forever. And I think she was right. My house is a reflection of my life and my travel and my loves. I have a lot of my country that I feed upon in my own home. Whether it is a lithograph of one of the first monuments in Bombay, as started by the British, or whether it is a Nandi, the venerable cow's head of the Hindus, or whether it is a Roman bust, a Peruvian frame, a painting of Boudin. It's very eclectic, my home. And we love it. And we have ne I've never bought a piece, of course, without my wife's blessing. I met him here in, um, in Los Angeles. A friend of ours, Denise Hale, insisted we meet. And uh, she was right. She's always been right. And I'm very grateful. I think we're both very grateful to her. I grew up in a very upper-middle-class home in Bombay, in a Parsi home. Parsis being the descendants of the Persian immigrants to the west coast of India about a thousand and one hundred years ago, fleeing from the massacres of Islam in Persia, where they wanted to retain their religion they came to India in three boats. They settled on the west coast in a little town called Sanjan and have lived at peace with the Indians for over a thousand years. Upper middle class education in a city like Bombay was mostly Jesuit. And I spent my years in a Jesuit school, St. Mary's in Bombay. But in our class of 40 boys, there were six different religions. Therefore, we in India, apart from the occasional Hindu-Muslim strife that one always hears about, we don't know what it is to look down or to look up to another religious group. We make fun a lot, but we learn from our childhood to coexist with other religions. And that's a very healthy way of growing up. And being a minority and Parsis, are only about 80,000 people in the world. A minority in Bombay, a city of 14 million, is really a minority. All the while, parallel to the Jesuit education, my musical studies never stopped. First of all, my love for it. And one has to know that my father, being a violinist and a co-founder of the Bombay Symphony Orchestra, we always had music in the house. My father would have sometimes the second violin group of the orchestra come to the house and he would train them. Then the violas would come, then the cellos would come. 
And this was taken for granted by my brother and I, apart from the fact that he would also teach the violin. He had a string quartet in the house. So I think from 8 o'clock in the morning till dinner time, my house was full of music continuously. Not only did I spend a wonderful year and a half in this college, but after I decided to completely radically change my way of life, I still kept on coming here and I studied for over a year or two years almost with a wonderful Jesuit father, Father Raphael, who taught me music theory, counterpoint, and fugue. My father educated me in the various sounds of the different orchestras of the world, of course, through recordings. We had recordings of Stokowski with the Philadelphia Orchestra, Furtwängler with the Berlin Philharmonic, and Toscanini with both the NBC and the BBC Symphony Orchestras. Growing up with these three masters of orchestral development gave me an incredibly strong background of interpretive skills. By the time I went to Vienna, I knew a lot of music. But being the early 1950s, I had never heard a hi-fi recording. And the only orchestra I had heard was the Bombay Symphony or, of course, 78 Revolution Records, the sound of which I can't emphasize enough was not what we hear today on our CDs. With the result that the first time I heard a great orchestra in a great concert hall with a great conductor was Karl Böhm conducting Brahms with the Vienna Philharmonic in the Musikverein Saal of Vienna. This sonic shock, I remember till today. Of course, Hans Swarovski starts then analyzing the scores, which of course I had never done in Bombay. Hans Swarovski was close to two great genius, Richard Strauss and Arnold Schoenberg. And what he passed on to myself and his other students was the discipline of Strauss as a conductor. The great tradition of Strauss as a conductor of Mozart operas, which of course Strauss inherited a little bit from Mahler too in the Vienna Opera. Hans Swarovski is one of the most cultured people that I have ever come across in my life. It became later on almost a father-son relationship in Vienna. And we used to walk in the streets of Vienna and talk about music and culture in general for hours. These hours I will never forget. I come to Vienna where Furtwängler has just passed away and I learn a lot about his way of looking between the notes, of seeing what the composer could not put down on paper, what Beethoven in the adagio of his Eroica, has such attention and such an incredible line. You must understand, even the theme, you can lose yourself if you don't concentrate and if you don't conduct the theme. The theme is so slow and so long, it's almost of a Brucknerian length. It was Furtwängler who really put it together and made it one line. 
If you hear other conductors, even of Fort Wagner's generation, you do not hear that line. Chamber music, because of my father's music making at home, has always been a great love of mine since my youth. Therefore, I was so pleased when Daniel Barenboim, Pinka Sukerman, Itzhak Perlman, Jacqueline Dupre, and myself, we got together in 1969 in London to make music with the Trout Quintet of Schubert, one of the great pieces of chamber music ever written. I've always played piano, never good enough to perform in public. And when I went to Vienna, I took up playing the bass because I wanted to play in an orchestra. I wanted to see the conductor or to learn from the conductor from the musician's point of view. I also wanted to learn the psyche of the orchestral musician. I could never have done that by just staying on the other side of the fence. I had to be amongst the musicians. So I learned the bass. And I started playing in Vienna, in churches, odd jobs, in symphony orchestras, always as a substitute. I learned a lot. Unfortunately, my conductor's career started too soon. I couldn't play in the orchestra as much as I originally had planned. Es beginnt Piano, aber das ist nie gewachsen. Es ist sehr wichtig, dass Sie müssen fühlen, dass, was für Klang gibt es und einfach heraus. Jetzt bitte, Celli, darf ich bitten, nach 66, dritte Takt. Ja. Was ist wieder los? I substituted for Igor Markevich in the autumn of 1960 in Montreal, was offered the job of music director starting 61, 62. In 61 January, I substituted for Fritz Reiner in Los Angeles, and by 1962, I was offered the position of music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra which then lasted for 16 years.
When I was first appointed music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, I happened to conduct my first concert in Salzburg at the festival in 1962, and Karajan asked me to come to visit him. And we sat for a long time in his home outside Salzburg, and he says, listen, I know you're going to an orchestra. By the way, he says, the Los Angeles Philharmonic is a very fine orchestra. I've conducted it a few years ago, and I think you're going to a good place, but be careful, because in America, one conducts a lot, one repeats the programs a lot. Be careful that you don't get into a routine. And then he mentioned a famous conductor's name, which I will not, of course, mention here, and said, look what happened to him. I always heard his voice saying, don't get into a routine. But of course, for me, that's difficult in any case, because I really put in 120%. Not because I want to, because the music just demands it of me. I can't help it. Montreal, I declined the music directorship after serving seven seasons because I just found it too time consuming to do both uh, jobs at the same time in North America. By then, my guest conductorship with Israel and my touring with them was increasing and my friendship and my love for this orchestra knew no bounds and I think it was vice versa too, so that by 1969, they offered me the music directorship, and since I was already free of my engagement in Montreal, from 69 then until 78, I was music director of Israel and Los Angeles simultaneously. After the first concert, you know, there are usually some functions. And Haftel, the concert master and the, one of the founding fathers of the orchestra, he said in his little speech when they gave me a metune, you know, he says, I think that we will spend our 50th anniversary together. <laughs> After 16 seasons in Los Angeles, when the New York Philharmonic offered me the position in their city as music director, I thought for both myself and for the Los Angeles Philharmonic, it was time to make a change. This was a marriage made in heaven, the one I had in Los Angeles. I made tons of recordings. We went on lots of tours. I engaged nearly 86 new musicians in this orchestra. And it was really sort of my dream instrument. In spite of it, I think at that point, somebody else should have come and given their interpretation of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. And similarly for me, I wanted to convince another body of my intentions. Therefore, I think it was a healthy break after 16 seasons. And so from 1978, I assumed the position of music directorship of the New York Philharmonic for 13 seasons at which point I had conducted over 1,100 concerts with them.
My musical tastes have always been quite eclectic, with the result that if you look at my programs, either in Los Angeles for 16 years or New York, Mozart and Stravinsky were the most played composers, plus music written day before yesterday and music written as far back as the 16th century. existence in Florence started actually in 1969, when for one year I was music director of the Maggio Fiorentino. And off and on I've been conducting operas there. I did, for instance, a whole ring cycle in the early 80s. But it was from 1986 that for every year I've been sort of the musical consultant for the orchestra, and I've done two operas every season at the Maggio. I've been on tour with the orchestra several times in Europe and South America. I've also had this incredible project of doing Turandot in the Forbidden City in Beijing. Turandot is by no means La Bohème. In that I mean it is not chamber music. Turandot is written in a grand scale. And like all other conductors who conduct Turandot, I've always wanted to do it in the Forbidden City in Beijing. I feel myself very fortunate that the Chinese government has given me the permission to bring my opera house from Florence and repeat the success that we have had with the great Chinese director Zhang Yimou on a slightly larger level in one of the courtyards of the Forbidden City. I look forward to it immensely. I feel that as a musician, I'm one of the few people that is blessed that every morning when I wake up, I touch genius. I never let myself forget this. I'm not the genius. It's the people's music that I perform, whether it's Bach, whether it's Mozart, whether it's Richard Strauss, Stravinsky, Arnold Schoenberg. We are constantly in the presence of greatness. I tell my musicians that in the orchestra. I said, don't take this for granted. Look around you. How many people have this fortune of being surrounded by this greatness?
There's something very mystical about this whole conducting profession, if you can call it. When you look at it per se, it's very simple. You can really learn it in a half an hour. But then you ask, why are there so few really great conductors, if it's that easy? Conducting is communication. You communicate with one musician, you communicate with a group in the orchestra, and you com communicate with the orchestra as a whole. What you communicate to them, or to him or her, has to convince him or her, or the group, or the orchestra, of what your intentions are. Your intentions come out of, hopefully, a deep knowledge of the score, and therefore of the style. Now, we don't play music written day before yesterday only. We play and we interpret music that is written over a 400-year period. Let's say, to make it simple, every 50 years in Europe, the style changes. Like fashion changed every 25 years. With every style, there's a sound connected to it. Mozart has a style and a certain sound. Late Beethoven has a certain style and a sound. Wagner, same thing. Then comes Strauss, Bruckner Mahler, then the whole Schoenberg school. The outsiders that come in with a very major influence, Stravinsky and Debussy, all have their sounds. Now, an orchestra is made out of 110 minds, interpreters. Somebody has to decide from the upbeat, which is the tempo, the speed of the music, then whether the different polyphonic voices blend together. He has to balance it. He has to check the internal intonation. He has to see whether the bowings played by the string musicians are logical to his interpretation of that particular phrase. And he has to have the construction of the piece very clear in his mind, so that he is the only one who always has the light at the end of the tunnel, the light at the end of the slow movement of the Eroica, the light at the end of a certain passage in Parsifal. The individual musician is too busy making music, pouring his heart out to concentrate on that light. It is the conductor who guides the general movement so that the construction at the end of the piece is logical. It is the mixture of all these qualities and the knowledge of which, which makes this mystical profession called conducting such a unique phenomenon of especially the 20th century. My mother is the real anchor and the strongest member of the family. Her quiet demeanor does not really tell the person who is communicating with her how strong she is. Because it was my mother who made two or three vital changes in her life and came out brilliantly. She was a Parsi housewife in Bombay with five servants who suddenly had to go to Manchester where my father was the assistant concertmaster of the Halle Orchestra. My father kept on playing music as he had done in Bombay, but it was my mother who changed her life. No servants, cooking three meals a day, carrying the coals from the cellar to put into the oven, managing with a completely different social structure in England, which in the 50s was not very partial, especially in a place like Manchester, to Indians. London is different. 
you have to go other places in England to know really how they feel about the colonies. The next change was America, which was slightly more comfortable, but still, it was a change. It was a completely new setting up of homes in Philadelphia, where my father was second violin of the Curtis String Quartet, and then finally to California. And this is where she has made her home for the last 30 years, and I must say she's very comfortable. One, two. Listen. My father, at the One, age of 90, two. has just retired as the music director of the American Youth Symphony, which he founded over 35 years ago in Los Angeles. It's a great orchestra, like a lot of wonderful young people's orchestras all over the world now. I want you much more. I was very happy to know that Zubin was so, so keen about music. In fact, we discovered, my wife and I discovered, that Zubin is going to be a musician, but we didn't know at that time, of course, what kind of a musician, since he was three or four years old. Because he would all the time insist on playing with my phonograph records and uh, sit, sit down and listen to my rehearsals in my home of chamber music, of orchestral music, of recitals and all that. And he was absolutely wound up with music completely. As he himself says in all his interviews, I've heard many of his interviews and in which he openly says that I was brainwashed with classical music since I was born. of Mozart, Verdi, Wagner, Strauss and Puccini. That is my operatic world. Now, as far back as 1966, I did the world premiere at the Met of Marvin Levy's Morning Becomes Electra. I'm going to be doing Riemann's world premiere in Munich uh, in 2001 of the house of Bernarda Alba. Of course, I've done Moses and Aaron, Wozzeck, so I have done uh, contemporary opera, but of course not as much as my favorites, Mozart, Verdi, Wagner, Strauss, Puccini. singing actors and I thoroughly enjoyed my entire experience with these three people, Espert, Lima and Ewing.
understand Beethoven's transition from the Eroica, which is the high point of all that happened before, of all that Beethoven knew before, he brings with the Eroica to a climax, stylistically. With the advent of Fidelio, he lays the foundation stone of romantic music, that which is to come. But if you don't know that Michelangelo did something similar hundreds of years before, you won't understand Beethoven either. Haydn, when he came back to Vienna from London, brought with him the concept for the first time of the large orchestra. Because his impresario in London, Salomon, gave him a rather large size orchestra. And so his sound concept had changed by the time he came back to Vienna after this stay in London, where he did a lot of concerts. There's an incredible tension right from the first bar that you feel that this is really a mass in time of war. And not only the passages of the timpani denote that, but the Agnus Dei, the suffering in the Agnus Dei, the beginning, is something that you can see where Beethoven took his ideas for the Missa Solemnis. I really feel I'm now ready to take up a repertoire house as the Munich Opera House is. Because apart from Vienna, I don't know of any other house in Europe, at least, that plays as much repertoire during the year as Munich does. The Opera House has a wonderful acoustic. The orchestra is great. The choir equals the orchestra, I think. I think the management team of the Munich Opera is ideal. And so when I was offered the job a couple of years ago, I really thought about it. I spoke about it with my wife because it means a drastic change for her too to move to Europe. And I decided I'm going to do it once and for all in my life to be a general music director of a Germanic opera house with this repertoire system.
love Munich. I think it's a fascinating city. Um, it has a special respect for itself, and I appreciate that. But I can't say I know it, and I can't say that I know the people well. And I found that I bring too much humor to the tables in Munich so far and try to lighten them a little, and nobody, very few people lightened up to that level that I'm used to. And so I feel um, I may have to change and understand a little more, and I look forward to that. My wife is not a connoisseur of music, but she has a great instinct, having been married to me for almost 30 years now. My wife always knows when there's been a special concert. Now, she doesn't come to every concert, of course, but on tour, she comes mostly to concerts, and she's very discerning about that. I know when something's wrong, and I also know when everyone is transported. That's an amazing thing, to see the same work night after night and see one performance that's just lifted to the skies as though another hand were playing, a larger hand. My father and my mother were divorced when I was very small, and uh, he was always touring and always on the road. So I've, I've always been used to having to, to seeing him one week in the summer, two weeks sometimes, maybe at Christmas. So uh, we've never spent a, a lot of time together, but when we are together, it's very good. Uh, on, on top of that, I have a second father, who is Zaren, who I've, I've lived with uh, since I'm six years old. So uh, I, have, I have the best of both worlds, because I have two. And not, uh, and not. And some people, when their parents get divorced, have no father. I had two, which was, uh, which was wonderful. My son is an actor who also dabbles in a little music management. My daughter is a housewife, taking care of her two children. And my parents are more immersed than any of the other members of the family in the world of music. Vier Takte vor 50. Dass man einfach sicher ist. Das heißt, ohne Senke ist. Peter Konvichny is one of those stage producers who knows the score inside out, who reads the music, and who sometimes even tends to choreograph the actions with the music. He knows it that well. Of course, with him, because of his radical conception, there are a lot of discussions. But on the whole, I really agree to try it out this way for once.
praised and I am criticized for doing too much. But too much has been the law of my life. It comes from the love. It is not only me. You can look at people in almost any profession who are obsessed with what they are doing. And the obsession and the love brings forth the energy that provides you to work and to make music 16 or 18 hours a day. And I love it.